All right, hi everybody. Um, today, um, well, first, welcome to the uh, Jack Star Guitar Hour. Today, we have an unusual show. <laughs> From deep in the jungles of blues and rock, come noted DJ, the Witch Doctor. The How are you doing, Witch Doctor? Yeah. I'm doing fine. Yeah. Very. How are you doing today? It's an honor to have you on, and um, I must say, I love your outfit. <laughs> It's a, uh, a one time for the Jack Star Guitar Hour outfit. And I really appreciate that. You're making me feel very uh, bluesy, you know. <laughs> kind of like, uh, there was a guy actually in the 60s or 50s named Screaming Jay Hawkins. Yeah. And he would come out of a coffin and he'd have a bone in his hand and he'd sing, I'll put a spell on you. I know the song well. So uh, I feel like we're tapping into that moment a little <laughs> bit, you know. Yeah, it's uh, it's uh, it's cool. It's it's uh, good to be here. I'm uh, I'm happy to be here and I get a chance to uh, you know have a little uh, bull session with you, ask a few questions, and uh, you know, talk about some of your music and your history. So it's all good. It really is all good, and I think it's a good uh, chance for people to discover uh, something about me, something about you, and and further the cause of the kind of music that we love. Oh yeah, definitely. So. So whatever is on your mind, I will do my utmost to answer, and maybe I'll get in a couple of questions as well. <laughs> it's, all, it's all fair. It's all, all fair in love and war, Jack. That's right. But uh, really, you know, the thing that's been on the top of my mind um, is ever since Monday night, the uh, Brevard Music Awards, the Bammies, as we like to call them. You know, yes. And, uh, of course, you were there and uh, presented a uh, prestigious award by Paul Chapman. Yeah, that was really a pleasant surprise. Uh, um, Heike had kind of told me a couple of weeks earlier that, that there would be a surprise, you know, and, but she didn't really want to go too much into detail. And it was really a nice touch having uh, Paul, who yeah. was really a great guitar player, uh, give me the award. And also given our kind of heavy metal backgrounds, both exactly. of us, you know. He had UFO and Wasted, and I had uh, Virgin Steel and Burning Star. So we kind of could relate to each other on this kind of heavy metal level. Even though we're, we're both, you know, kind of old. <laughs> but I guess there's no, there's no age for metal. You're only as old as you feel, Jack. That's right. And there's no age for blues either. Exactly. Or for being a witch doctor. <laughs> <laughs> That's for sure. Um, yeah, you talked a little bit about Paul and, uh, and his background with the uh, UFO and Wasted. I don't think too many people know about Wasted, but I actually did have that cassette, Walls Fall Down. Cool. And uh, I, play, I have his music, and I play it from time to time on my show, which will be here one of these days when we get around to it. But um, So what exactly is the Ambassador Award? Well, before we get to that, let me just say, you mentioned Wasted. Mm -hmm. I'm also one of the other people that knows about Wasted. <laughs> And I even know, I think the band got its name from the bass player. Pete, Pete Way. Way. Yep. You're up on this stuff. <laughs> and uh, Pete Way is just an incredible bass player who, who used to play this big Firebird bass, you know, yeah. which is kind of like the guitar Johnny Winter used to play, the Firebird, but there was a bass model of it. Wow. And uh, it was just some bass player. So, so I wanted to mention that, yeah, I, I was into uh, his playing, Paul's, Paul Chapman's playing, before I actually met him. In other words, I knew he was. I'd actually bought, I think, two albums that he was on. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of them sticks out in my mind. It's, uh, he did a song called uh, Train Train, or, which was also done by Blackfoot. And he does this incredible acoustic solo before the song begins. And I remember buying that, and I was going, who is this guy? You know, like, you know, like this guy can play. Yeah. And then it was just kind of weird. I moved to Brevard, and uh, I meet him, but under weird circumstances, it turns out that uh, the bass player in my metal band, Ned Maloney, uh, his wife, his wife's mother, is married to Paul. Wow. <laughs> so, so in actuality, Paul Chapman is the father-in-law of my bass player. That's cool. All right. it's, it's all very <laughs> interesting and only in rock and roll yes, and yes. metal does stuff like this happen. But he is a great guy, makes a very good uh, tandoori chicken <laughs> and plays great guitar. So what more, what more do you want out of a person? That sounds good to me. But getting back, you asked a question and then I kind of digressed right. and took it somewhere else. So 
The question was about the BAMIs. What's about the Ambassador Award itself? I mean, is that, is that a new award for the BAMIs? Or? I think uh, they've done this before, and uh, it's basically a pretty nice uh, thing. I mean, it, it's, I guess, Heike and the magazine telling me they think enough of me to name me an ambassador. They think that I'm past the point of trashing hotel rooms and <laughs> having sex with underage groupies and destroying things and throwing televisions out of windows. They think I'm safe now. They can give me an ambassadorship. And Heike, you're right. I'm too old for all that stuff. <laughs> but, you know, I can, I'm thinking back, you know, you were, you start out in the middle, you know, business, and I'm um, thinking you probably had some of those crazy times. We did have some crazy times, I, I have to admit, and uh, it's all part of the learning process. And I think it's almost like it's like pre-required pre, uh, of you, you know? <laughs> it's like, you play in a band? Okay, we know you're going to trash this hotel room. I think we'll bill you beforehand. <laughs> There you go. I understand you know, that. And um, now we've, you know, we've all done kooky things, you know. And um, well, <laughs> how old were you when you picked up the guitar? I know you had your guitar for a little while and like shoved it under the bed. That is so true. Uh, I was about, uh, I think, eleven or twelve. I really wanted a guitar. I thought it was cool. You know, hey, you know, you can get girls and you can stand in front of a mirror and you know go nuts and. And it was right around the time the Beatles were coming out and everything. The only thing is, they forgot to tell me it's really hard to play that thing. <laughs> you know, I just wanted instant gratification. I wanted to grab that guitar and start burning solos and it uh, didn't happen. So I basically put the guitar under the bed for about three years. And I knew it was there and it knew I was there. And we, kinda, we had an unspoken truce. I won't bother you, don't bother me. <laughs> and the guitar sat under the bed. And then one day, uh, I just became friends with this guy, Richie Michelle, that was his name, and another guy named Bruce first. And, I, and they played guitar, and I said, you know, could you guys, like, take a look at this guitar I have? You know, is it playable? Can you show me something? And lo and behold, it was actually a playable, decent guitar. Cool. They showed me a couple of uh, riffs and chords. And then uh, one thing led to another, and I was... Got addicted. <laughs> well, you know, I, I had a guitar one time, and uh, I kind of thought, wow, oh, you know, I should just like get a guitar and be cool and get the chicks, right? Right. But of course, I just had a small little practice amp, and yeah, it's, it's like you said, it's a very, um, very challenging instrument to, uh, to pick up, and I had no musical talent, so that's why I just play everybody's music by now on my radio show. So. Well, that's <laughs> a good musical talent, because we need you to do that. But uh, you were talking when you were young, right? yes. so this is a question that uh, kind of, uh, I kind of, you know, one of your uh, people close to you wanted to know the answer to this question. What advice do you have for young musicians these days? Uh, okay, that's a good question. I mean, the first advice I would have is don't run before you can walk. Um, I know everybody wants to be, you know, like the fastest gun in the West, the fastest guitar the most flamboyant, play behind your back, play with your teeth, uh, you know, all that stuff. Um, it really is important to get the basics first. Um, of course, I'm saying that, and I really didn't do that. <laughs> I went right into, you know, trying to be the fastest gun, blah, blah, blah. But then I had to go back and learn the basics. I mean, literally, like, I would say eight to ten years into it, Really? I was not happy with the way I was playing. I wasn't happy that I didn't have a good knowledge of blues and blues progressions. In fact, I remember this, this guy. He was an older guy because he was like two, three years older than us. This bass player named John Light. And he told me one day, he goes, Jack, you're going to be a great guitar player one day, but you really need to learn how to play a blues progression correctly. And I said, w what do you mean, man? Like, uh, I can play Johnny Be Good. Because no, no, there's all kinds of progressions. You've got to change at the exact right time. Uh, you need to learn the one, four, five, and you need to master that and to be able to go in and out of it at will and to know what you're doing. Uh, I took his words to heart, and I really uh, 
wanted to really master that, you know, the whole right. blues idiom. So when you say one, four, or five, for people who are not really musically inclined, or you're talking like from the Nashville numbering system? Uh, it, well, no, what I really mean is That's that is the one, four, five in blues, okay. the one chord is your first chord. The four chord is your second chord. So let's say if you're playing in the key of A, your first chord is A. Your second chord, which is the four chord, is the D. The yeah, five okay, chord I'm is the resolve chord, which would be the E. So hence, one, four, five. Okay, I'm with you now. Okay. I learned something. Yeah. But you know what? There's all kinds of blues progressions. It's just that the one, four, five is the most common. And another way you can relate to it is songs like uh, Wild Thing. That's a one, four, five. Uh, Hang on, Sloopy. One, four, five. Um, Kansas City is a one, four, five. Pride and Joy by Stevie Ray is a one, four, five. And it goes on and on. Rock Me Baby is a one, four, five. So uh, it's really important to master that. And that, to answer your question, because I know I get a little long-winded. <laughs> you know, once Will gave me my own show, that was it. It was like I had the, the, the permit to be long-winded. Exactly. You know? Will gave me the permit. You know, thank you, Will. So uh, it's like it's really important to get back to your question, just to learn the basics. And that's really what the advice that I would give. And I see a lot of really great young guitar players, by the way, in Brevard, as you know. Yeah, I've seen several on your show. And we'll get, I have some other questions about that, but I'll okay. finish that thought first. Yeah, absolutely. But there are some really great... Uh, young guitar players coming up and um we'll we'll definitely touch on that as well yeah yeah um i've, I've watched some of your, of your shows and um i'm just kind of amazed that like i think there are I don't, i'm not really going to say secrets but i think there are secrets to playing the guitar yes and you don't have a problem like trying to teach people show them those secrets no absolutely not and uh it's funny though that you hit upon that because I remember I was reading this thing about Eddie Van Halen, and I thought it was the goofiest thing. Okay, he used to play with his back facing the wall. He didn't want other guitar players, this is when he first started doing all the tapping stuff, to pick up on his tapping technique. He used to actually f face the wall. He would be playing at the Whiskey A Go-Go or the Starwood Club, all these clubs. And I'm trying to visualize <laughs> Van Halen. You've got David Lee Roth, you know, going nuts. Right. You really got me, and you got Eddie facing the wall. So, no. Um, I mean, I can understand a little bit why Eddie did that, but I think we're so far into this. There's films, there's videos. You want to see Hendrix, there's a million DVDs. You want to see Eddie, there's a million DVDs. Um, nothing that I have that I can do is a secret, and I'm more than happy to share it with anyone. So, it's all good. And uh, I'm glad you mentioned that about Eddie. Um, because uh, I don't know if you know the name Tom Hambridge. Yes. He writes a lot of blues for a lot of different people. Yes. Um, I met him and hung out with him, and he told the exact same story. A friend of his had a club in Texas, and he said, I don't know what this guy's doing, Tom. you got to come down and watch him. And it was uh, Eddie playing. Right. And they were all trying to figure out what it was. So that's cool. It's amazing, yeah. yeah. But, um, yeah, no, it's cool that we touched upon that. I think we're going to take a little break right now. If I know you got a big pot stirring. <laughs> <laughs> Backstage, we're going to make a gumbo with a couple of human remains now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll be back in a few short minutes. Stick around.
We're back. Man, that was, uh, that was some stew there. Yeah, pretty tasty, huh? Very tasty. Some of the bones were a little big, but, you know. Yeah, I got some of those caught in my hair, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but uh, yeah, uh, we were talking during the break when we were having some stew there about uh, Brevard County and uh, other musicians in Brevard County. But this is a question, actually, for you from Walter J. And wow. he, he has two words, Jack. He wants to know, why Brevard? <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> well, I moved to Brevard because my bass player, Ned Maloney, uh, was living in Palm Bay, and we were having a really horrible winter in uh, New York around 2003. And I'm talking to Ned all the time, like every week or so, and he'd be telling me, oh, it's so beautiful down here. <laughs> Palm trees are looking good. I think I'll go to the beach today. And, uh, and, I'm saying, and I was basically saying, you bastard, <laughs> I'm shoveling snow. It's horrible. I'm freezing, uh, and uh, and the oil bills are like ridiculous. Yeah. You know, it was like six hundred dollars a month just to heat your house. And then uh, and then I said, but but Ned, you got to come up, man. It's time to record an album now. And he goes, well, I have a good idea. He goes, why don't you come out here? I found a really great studio right here in Palm Bay. Wow. And I was thinking about it and I go well he's probably just saying that because he doesn't want to come up to New York <laughs> but anyway I started thinking it over and I, and I said okay I'll come down and when I came down I was really blown away by how nice the weather was and how laid back everything was and um, 
and I wasn't doing really great financially, and I could, I realized, wow, I could actually buy a house out here, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so that was a good plus, and that's how I moved to Palm Bay. Cool. To uh, the whole Brevard, you know. Good, 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 good. And uh, I, um, I don't know. I've lived here a long time, and I know you've been around a lot of places. I've had been around my share of places also, but to me. For the small size of this area, there seems to be an inordinate amount of good talent around here. Yeah, and I, I totally agree with you. It, it's it's very surprising, actually. You know, there must be something in the water, because you know, I mean, I hear some of these guitar players that are you know like sixteen years old. Yeah. How the heck are they playing so good at such a young age or at any age? I mean, it's pretty. Yeah, there are. There's a really really some amazing talent. Some of them we've actually had on the show, as you yeah. know. Uh, we had uh, Coleman Wilcox. Coleman, yeah. We had Travis mm -hmm. Daigle, I think his last yep. name is. Travis. Yep. Uh, no, I mean, these guys are, they're teenagers. Exactly. And uh, they're playing some really tasty, very uh, very confident kind of playing, you know, very uh, on the money. So, yeah. And, and it's not only the young guys, too. I mean, there's a lot of older guys around here, a lot of established bands that have been around that, I mean, just to me, when I first came here, I really wasn't into the blues as much right. as I am now. But living here in Brevard County, it seems like you can't help but get into the blues. I'll tell you, there's some world-class talent uh, here. Uh, for instance, uh, you had a guy named Steve Thorpe mm -hmm. who passed away a few years ago. Uh, tremendous guitar player. Yeah. Um, as good as anybody out there, you know, and, and now... Uh, there are guys that are playing that you can see in clubs all the time that are really very, very good. Uh, you've got, uh, like, Dave Curry, yeah. host of Jam at uh, Lose Blues. Great guitar player. Uh, surprisingly good. I mean, he'll, he'll play songs that you would never expect, and he'll nail them. Uh, you've got uh, John Quinn Living, who yeah, does a really yeah. good job, also host of Jam. Uh, You've got Howie, Howie Katz, <laughs> uh, from the Guitar Haven, who's a good blues guitar player. Uh, you've got a new guy in town named Aaron. I think his last name is Rhodes. Really? Really good guitar player. Huh. Uh, I've seen him play. You've got, uh, uh, let's see. Walter J. Walter J. Yeah. I forget Walter J. I mean, I mean Walter does uh, Stevie Ray to a T. Exactly. And that's no little feet you know you need to you need to be able to nail that rhythm that that stevie does you know and walter's got it um you've got austin pettit great oh, guitar yeah. player I've really loved good for, since the, the groove monster days with right. dave feaster yeah really good on the slide and just a good all-around player um i'm probably leaving out a bunch of people oh, oh and you know who i think is really good uh, the young guy that used to play in Vintage. Uh, oh, Shane. Shane. Yeah. I saw him play really, really good. Uh, so there is... Uh, Russ Kellum. Wait, who else? Russ Kellum. Oh, Russ Kellum's a really good player. Absolutely. Um, I'm probably going to leave out a whole bunch of people. But, you know, just to give so you... There's so many, you know. There's so many guys that are really, really good. And then in the heavy metal world, uh, uh, the guys from Who Was I great guitar player i mean he's got that that drop d tuning down really really well and you know and that's brutal playing right but you know they do it good you know so um so we've got our share of gun guitar gunslingers oh, out I'm here telling you. Oh, i'm you know. telling you um another question i had for you yeah it, it's it's um always interesting to me musicians write songs and for some musicians, it's easier than others to write, right. of course. But what is some of the stimulus that, that uh, you know, makes you want to write a song about something? That's a good question. Well, I think a lot of times for me, I'll see something in the newspaper. Someone will say something. Or I'll hear an expression that's kind of cool. And I'll just think, wow, maybe that would be a cool song. You know, um, so, like, take the case of Iron Maiden. Uh, a lot of their songs are actually movie titles. Really? I mean, and I didn't, about that. I didn't realize that until I was in a video store one day, and <laughs> I'm looking at all these movies, and it's like, wow, every other video <laughs> was an Iron Maiden song title. Like, you know, Two Minutes to Midnight. Uh, right, yeah. 
Dance of Death, The Trooper, all, they were all like song titles. Uh, the band Black Sabbath, they got their name from a movie by, uh, with Boris Karloff called Black Sabbath. Yeah. So I think, you know, you get influenced by stuff that you see and, um, and then you just go with it, you know. That's, uh, that's, that's interesting, you know, I've never really heard anybody say what, you know, gets their creative juices going as far as songwriting, so. It could really honestly be anything. I mean, you could hear somebody say something and overhear it at the next table in a restaurant and it's like, wow, what a cool, you know, idea for a song. Right. Or for an album title or for whatever, you know. And speaking of songs... <laughs> about things. Yes. You uh, you told me you were working on a new song, something to do with um, headlights or something? Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll just give you a brief <laughs> little synopsis. I was thinking the other day, okay, ZZ Top, they wrote a wonderful song called Tush, yep. which is about ladies' posterior. Yeah. The butt. The wonders of the butt. Well, exactly. Then they wrote another wonderful song called Legs about what we men love to see. Yeah. Women's, women's legs. legs. It's, you know. And you as a witch doctor, I mean, I, <laughs> you especially. So, and I was thinking, ZZ Top missed a part, a part of the women's body. Boobs. Ah. Headlights, whatever. <laughs> 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 so, in my infantile... Uh, <laughs> thought pattern I said you know I need to I need to remedy and write that wrong so I started about writing a song called Headlights which is really taken shape the hardest part wasn't the music it was the lyrics because I wanted it to relate to the subject right. without being kind of too overly uh, direct I can understand that you yeah. know kind of leave it to the <coughs> imagination <laughs> but let's just say when you, which doctor, were young, and when, I, and when I was young, there was a certain fascination when we were about 12, 13. <laughs> we were wondering, what do they have that we don't have, and why does it look so nice? And can, will they be nice enough to show it to us yeah. one day? <laughs> So I, really, I really liked how you uh, described the song, saying that it was shaping up. <laughs> yeah, it was, I didn't even realize I said that, but it, it's shaping up, yeah. And, you know, I figured, you know, um, for all those uh, copies of Playboy that I had to hide under the bed and <laughs> National Geographic, and I figured now is the time for me to write um, kind of an ode, a tribute to women's breasts. Well, I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so am I. <laughs> and on that kind of lecherous note, <laughs> I don't know how we got there, but we're going to take a short break and let you all ponder the meaning of all this. So we'll see you in a few.
All right. We're back again, and seated next to me is the one and only witch doctor. The one and only. That's some more of that stew gumbo on there. <laughs> Break. It was good stuff. That was good stuff, man. Definitely. Yeah. And then when you look at that stuff, Jack, it kind of looks like um, dirty water. You know, dirty water. What yeah. a great segue. Yes, and you, I you, like that. your most, your most current CD uh, is uh, swimming in dirty water. Yes, and yeah. uh, that was actually one. I got the idea for that honestly. I had a house in uh, Palm Bay a couple of years ago, and it was always a big chore to get that pool clean. <laughs> and sometimes the laziness would prevail, and the pool looked pretty bad, kind of greenish. <laughs> and uh, one day I had a buddy of mine over. I think it was actually Ned. And Ned goes, uh, you know, you really should clean the pool once in a while. You can't go swimming in this thing. It would be like swimming in dirty water. And my mind didn't even listen to what he was saying, right. just the title. Oh, yes, Women in Dirty Water. I like that. And eventually I did clean the pool. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good thing. You know? Yes, it's a good um, thing. So that is the most current disc you have out right now, correct? No. No, it's but not? But close. You're okay. close. It's the most current bluesy, bluesy kind of disc. disc. Okay. Um, we actually put a metal out mat on 11-11-11. Okay. Which makes it almost... Two years old now, or about it? Yeah, almost guess, two yeah. years old. <clears throat> and uh, that is our most current. Okay. But there's also a thing called reissues, right. where record companies take one of your old albums, repackage it, and put it out there. So those would have to be the latest okay. if we count those. Okay. Know? And that would be the reissue of uh, No Turning Back, a metal album from 1988. And that was with Burning Star, With right? Burning Star, yeah. yeah. So the reissues keep coming, and I'm really thankful that there are some people out there that want to hear this stuff. And right. uh, some of it is also a way of uh, preempting the eBay sellers that will take, well, like one of my albums, they want like $65. So wow. I looked at it today, and it was like, what the heck? I can't even afford my own album, <laughs> you know? So luckily, uh, there's a label in Germany that's going to be putting it out. Uh, uh, well, actually, the label in Germany is putting out Out of the Darkness, okay. which was something I did in 84. And then there's a label in Poland called Skoll Records, which is going to be putting out the Orange album. So both those albums are scheduled to come out. And I think once they come out, it'll be a good thing because people will be able to buy it right. without paying exorbitant <coughs> prices to get it. You know. Yeah, And uh, you're currently working on a couple more albums, correct? Yes. Uh, Ned and I are working on a metal album, uh, uh, tentatively titled Stand Your Ground, and uh, we're really well into it now, and we've got, uh, we got most of the songs blueprinted or outlined. Right. In fact, uh, one of the times I was on the show and I used that word blueprinted, and somebody said, what do you mean by blueprinting a song? All I mean is you're just basically, you're getting the outline of it, like kind of right. like in building a house. I think you built the frame. What do you? No, the foundation. Foundation. So right. it's kind of like the foundation of a house. So we've got that going, and I think we'll be done with it probably in about four or five months. All right, cool. And you're working on, uh, in conjunction with that, a, a bluesy disc also. Well, that's kind of in the planning stages <coughs> right now because uh, uh, I don't really have all the songs, you know. But I have about three or four songs. One of the ones we talked about earlier, headlights. <laughs> And it's going to be blues, or it's going to be blues rock. Cool. You know, it's not going to be you know, strictly blues, you know. All right, let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about um, your, uh, the band you're playing with now. I'm playing with some guys that I met, some local guys that are real good. Um, and we are calling ourselves Blues DeVille. And we've been doing gigs for the last uh, two or three months. And uh, we've actually got a bunch of gigs coming up. Uh, next gig, Saturday, at Steagles in Melbourne. Then we got um, the following Saturday at the Sebastian Beach Inn oh, in really? Sebastian, Florida. And then we've got a, a show at Winfield's on the 27th, which is a Saturday. And then we've got a show coming up at a place called, called Sands on the Beach in Melbourne Beach. I know where that is. Yeah, so we're, uh, we're playing out a lot, and, uh, and it's really good to... Um, it's really good to get out there and play. You know, it helps, uh, it helps keep the chops up and, uh, and you get to meet people. Right, yeah, exactly. And, and have been, fun. I've been to several of your shows. Right. You know, and uh, I really enjoy them. And I cool. think your band is 
getting tighter all the time? Yeah, that's what we're trying to do, you know, just uh, develop that kind of silent communication that really good bands have. Um, I mean, I was reading an interview with, uh, I think it was Mick Jagger, actually, and he was saying that there's an art to playing on stages that are humongous because if you don't have this magic connection right. with the guys in your band, there's no way you'll get through the gig because literally... Your, your bass player might be like, you know, an eighth of a mile away from you. <laughs> you know, I mean, those stages are humongous. And I've, I've been fortunate to play on a couple of those kind of stages. And if you don't have like a really tight band, you will not get through the gig. And, and so I think this, the gigs that we're doing are making us tighter right. and uh, more <clears throat> able to communicate. And same thing when, uh, with my metal band. Before we went to Europe, we did a whole bunch of gigs in Brevard, and it really helped us to That's do. The, uh, we did about we actually did twelve warm up gigs. Wow! Yeah, and uh, one of them was at Florida Discount Music. Uh, <laughs> I don't think the people knew what to expect that <laughs> night because usually they're used to getting more mellow, you know, kind of music. Right. You know, singer songwriters and guys playing acoustic guitars. And, and Rhino is one of the loudest drummers in rock, and he played, he played with the loudest band in the Guinness Book of Records, Man of War. So that was quite an interesting show <laughs> for a discount. And then we played uh, Blues Blues uh, yeah. on a Tuesday night. I mean, we were really surprised that so many people showed up. I don't wow. know how they knew, but before we knew it, we saw a packed house on a Tuesday night. Uh, we played at... Uh, place called the 321 Club in Coco, and that also was a weird experience because we pulled up at this club and everybody in that club looked like they were early 20s and they were into this whole gothic look, you know, like <laughs> dyed black hair, uh, piercings, tattoos, the whole nine yards. And, you know, and I mean, I could have been the father of a lot of <laughs> these people, you know, <laughs> and so could Rhino and so could Ned, you know, and... Um, and I think in the beginning, everybody was like, kind of like this. All right, old guys, show us what you got, you know. <laughs> so it was, and then we just really proceeded to play our hearts out. And uh, the people loved it. And, and then afterwards, they were telling us, we love old school metal. You guys are great. Who are you guys? Where do you come from? What are you doing here? You know, and that's always a good reaction. Yeah. You know? When someone tells you in a nice way, what are you doing here? Yeah. And that's you, always good. And you're not expecting it. It's just it's great, you know. No, it was like about, when I first moved to Florida, I was playing in this cover band for about a year, and I remember we played at this little place in Melbourne called uh, Missing Time, or Missing... Killing, Killing Time, Killing thank time. you. Yeah, I've heard of oh, that. We got a smart audience, okay. Killing, yeah, Cheers yeah. for Scarlet. Yeah. It was the Killing Time Tavern, okay. This big biker dude comes up to me, and this guy was big. Of course, a lot of people look big to me. I'm only like five <laughs> foot six. So. But anyway, this guy was really big. He comes up to me after we do our set, and he goes, he goes, what the hell are you doing here? I go, oh, damn, what did I do? You know, did I look at his old lady a little too long? What did I do? You know? And I go, uh, I go, what do you mean, man? And he goes, he goes, what I mean is, what are you doing playing in a little dump like this place? Why aren't you out doing big stages? Why aren't you playing in an arena somewhere? I go, oh, I was like really relieved. I go, oh, <laughs> thank you so much. As a matter of fact, I do once in a while, you know, play large stages in Europe with my other band when we do metal and all that. But I was just so happy that he said yeah. that. <laughs> like, what the hell are you doing here? <laughs> and, you know, when I, do, when I see you guys, I mean, that was kind of my first impression. The first night I saw you was like, who is this guy and why is he in this little bar in Brevard County? You know, and then... I started doing a little research, and I was really like, why is this guy here? <laughs> and, and, you know, and the immediate answer is because I love music. Mm -hmm. And I would play even smaller places if there were smaller places. It doesn't matter as long as, as long as you get to play and you share what you do with people that dig it. Yeah, and, and another thing I like about your, your band, Blues DeVille, is you guys aren't afraid to, if somebody's in the audience, somebody walks in the door who you recognize as a musician, you try to get them up there to play. We do. I think <laughs> we have done that, <laughs> as you know. We have gotten people right up from the audience uh, to come up and play with us. And I think it's just like kind of sharing the, uh, the spontaneity and the joy of a show. 
you know? Yeah. Because after I saw your show with Walter J, then I, I happened to be at the club you were playing oh. the next weekend, and he came in, and oh, he had Walter up there on the stage along with several other people. Oh, Walter, like, just came up there and just killed it, you yeah. know? I mean, you know, he, he's not shy. He'll come up there, and he'll just lay out his whole show and just... <laughs> You know, he's he's great, and uh, you got guys that that will don't play on a dime. They don't need to have their guitar, their right. amp, their band, their whatever. You know, some guys have all these restrictions. Well, I can only play if I have eaten uh, an Indian meal, <laughs> <laughs> or if I have you know, if I'm wearing my lucky whatever. You know, but you know, Walter just come up and wail and. Yeah. Um, and he told me afterwards that he really liked playing my guitar. Yeah. And I was happy about that because I've gotten really good feedback on the different players that have played my guitar. Another guy that told me he really liked my guitar, and I forgot to mention him, is Chuck Van Riper. Oh, yeah. Chuck came up, and uh, he jammed with us uh, at Stiegel's, and uh, he played my Strat. And afterwards, he goes, man, that's a really good Strat. And uh, so I was happy to hear that. And, and, you know, of course, Chuck is a great player. Yeah, I was impressed. I saw him that night, and I was like, wow. He, he killed it. He was amazing. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> this woman, uh, it was kind of an interesting story. This woman was with her daughter. Her daughter had been kind of like homebound for about three or four years due to some kind of issues where she didn't want to leave her house. And that was like the first time her daughter had left the house. Wow. In a couple of years. Holy cow. And so she came up to us and said, could you play this, this song? Uh, I think the song was Bluebird by the Beatles. And I said, I would love to be able to play it, but I don't know it. <laughs> so I said, but, but it was think, I was thinking, maybe someone will come in here that knows it. Two minutes later, Chuck Van Riper walks in. <laughs> and I know Chuck knew it. Yeah. So I said, Chuck, I have, I have a mission for you. Should you choose to accept and uh, he played the song. The audience went nuts. Uh, the women was like thrilled, you know. And it was just, it was a good thing because I felt that I was part of something that was really positive. Cool. Cool. So speaking of your guitar, because I know we're getting close to going to break, what, what is your guitar? What year? My guitar is a 1984 Strat. And uh, I actually got it, I think, around 1990. And... Um, at the time, uh, I wasn't really doing great financially, you know, like a lot of musicians, you know, sleeping on your girlfriend's couch, <laughs> you have a horrible little car that barely runs, you know, st stuff like that. And when I got this guitar, it was like a big investment, you know, wow, $400, you know. And, um, and at the time, you know, I would sometimes, I was collecting guitars on and off, and sometimes, like, if I needed money, I'd sell the guitar. And I didn't really want to sell this guitar. So I, I thought, well, I'm going to personalize this guitar right. so that basically nobody's going to want it. <laughs> and I had my dad's, uh, my friend's dad, my, my best friend Reno lived across the street, and his dad would do this thing, wood burning. So I had the idea. I said, I'm going to ask my friend's dad to wood burn my name into it. And that's what I did. And then from then on, I decided, you know what? I'm not going to pamper this guitar. I'm just going to let it get beer stains, cigarette smoke, whatever, burn marks. And literally, I mean, it started looking like I had dragged the guitar with a <laughs> rope behind my car. And that's pretty much what it looks like now. And, and so it's, uh, it's definitely got the relic look. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting. Interesting for sure. And that's my main guitar. And, I've, and I'm happy that I never sold it. And I'm happy that I put my name on it. Because, really, the only person that's going to want it would be like an extreme fan of mine somewhere in Europe. And out here, I don't think, I think I've killed the value of it, so I'm happy. <laughs> uh, I think we're going to take a little break now. Sounds good. And ponder these uh, issues.
fast. Sorry about it.
All right. Okay, we are back with the Witch Doctor. Yeah, and Mr. Jack Star of Jack Star's Guitar Hour. Thank guitar you. Guru. Guitar Guru. <laughs> well, I just like to play tasty guitar, but I am not tasty. <laughs> I do not taste good. <laughs> okay, thanks for clarifying that. Yeah. You know, I don't know. I know you got a big pot stew in back there. Oh, right? yeah. Yeah. But uh, so we have a stack of all these CDs, Jack. These are all your CDs? Yeah, it's quite yeah. a. I know, it's a lot. I actually, I just grabbed whatever I could <laughs> coming here. I definitely am a repeat offender in yeah. making CDs. I and can see that. I've been fortunate enough to be on a lot of labels. I. Probably been on over 30 labels throughout wow. the world and um, made a lot of CDs pretty much starting in 1982. Really? That's when, that's when it all started, huh? That's when it kind of started. I got this band, uh, Virgin Steel. Uh, we started in 81. We put out our first album. We have one of those here somewhere. Right? I think there might even be one in here. It's probably the reissue that was on Sanctuary Records. I don't have my glasses, so yeah. <laughs> I'll help you because okay. I think I know what they look like. Ah, There it is. There it is. That album originally came out in 1982, and that album came out on, a, on our own label, uh, which we pressed up like 5,000 copies, and within about six months, it got picked up by 10 other labels, Wow! including, I'll give you a partial list, Music for Nations in Britain, uh, Burnett, CBS in France, A&M Records in uh, Canada, uh, Roadrunner Records in the Benelux countries, which are Belgium, Luxembourg, and all that, Holland. Uh, Power, Power Records in New Zealand, wow. which is part of CBS. Uh, I don't know, a lot. It's on my website. If people are interested, they can see uh, all the labels that picked up each record. And uh, Swimming in Dirty Water, we discussed that one. Swimming in Dirty Water... Yeah. Um, actually was never on a label it's something that i you know paid for and did and came out in 2008 and um it's a cool album and it's kind of like southern rock cool i uh, and uh, rhino plays it. you do oh he does rhino plays drums right, on it cool. yeah so it's a cool album and then i think we have some uh well, i don't know you have to tell me jack because i don't know just show them and I'll, okay let's see that's out of the darkness that came out in 1984 on a very big independent label in America called Passport. And uh, I was definitely a fan of Passport Records back then. They had, uh, they had Leslie West. They had oh, Al Stewart yeah. with Ear of the Cat. They had Bill Wyman of the Rolling Stones who had a band. They had Wendy O. Williams. They had uh, all these really great acts like Rick Derringer and Leslie West. And, and anyway, um, I got a deal on Passport, and uh, there was only really two bands from New York that were on that label. It was me and a band called The Good Rats. I love The Good Rats. You the know Good that. Rats were cool, yeah. And you know, Leslie West uh, just had a new disc out recently um, with uh, Joe Bonamassa, uh, Billy Gibbons, right. Slash, several guitar oh, players. Le Leslie is just such an influential guitar player, you yeah. know. Um, I would really loved seeing him when I was a kid. I would go see him all the time. Yeah, I heard he had some problems, I think... Uh, uh, if I can remember correctly, lost one leg recently. Did he? Oh, boy. Yeah. Uh, I think diabetes or something, I heard. Oh, that's sorry to hear that. Oh. All right, what have we got now? We're okay. showing another album. Okay, oh. let's take a look. Woo, Defiance. This is the album that took six years to make. <laughs> we got signed to Magic Circle Music in 2003, and we patiently assembled the band. We, f we auditioned like 50 singers. We finally found a singer. Uh, we started writing the music, recording demos, and uh, six years later, in 2009, it came out. Wow, so really? It took six, six years? Six years to make that album. Did I already show this one? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Uh, we, oh. No, we didn't show that okay. one. That's Land of the Dead. That's the one that came out on 11-11-11 on a German label called Lim. And then in America, it's distributed by Media One. Media One uh, distributes uh, bands like Chicken Foot, the band with uh, Sammy Hagar Sammy and all that. And, Michael Anthony, and, yeah. and they distribute some other famous bands that, um, that I never heard of. But <laughs> 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 no, but they're like famous, but it's like kind of like new metal. Right. 
so they're famous, but if you, I don't, wouldn't know who they are, but if you're 20 years old, you know who they are. And uh, I just want to say they're doing a great job because I went to the mall in Melbourne and I saw the album there. No I was way. Like, yes, really? the album is wow. there and Burning Star has its own little card, you know, index card, you know. Oh, that, then, then you know you're moving up in the world if you're in the music store at the mall and you got your little card. And I knew that that was happening because I got an email from somebody in like Indiana and they bought the album at the mall. Okay, this one's called uh, Rock the American Way. That came out in uh, 1985. There's a little controversy with that when that got reissued. I can see that. In 2002, the controversy was it kind of looked a little bit like a Twin Towers thing mm -hmm. with the top of the building getting, you know, sliced off. Uh, we, we put that album out in 1984, so obviously, you know, we would yeah. never yeah. do anything that would be tasteless or that would disrespect, you know, the memory of the, the 3,000 people that perished uh, uh, in the Twin Towers. Yeah, you today know. happens to be the anniversary, you know. Yeah, there's an anniversary coming up. And I think, to, to uh, digress a tiny bit, Walter j has got a song about that. I think really? it's called 6,000 Souls. And we're going to have Walter J on the show and you know, playing that song. Cool. Uh, oh. Soon Day Will Come. That's a, a Latin album that I did in uh, 1990. That got reissued. And it's really in 2012. And it's really cool because um, the front is me in 2012. The back is me in 1990. <laughs> so if you flip it around, you, you will see uh, a 12 years younger Jack in uh, 1990. And uh, that album is, I think, a really good album, uh, if I say so myself, which I really shouldn't <laughs> say that. But uh, it's cool because it's kind of Latin sounding and we had conga players and uh, the singer that sang on it, because I did not sing on that album, is a guy uh, named Dan Barrios and uh, his uh, uncle, I think, is Tito Puente, the famous uh, Latin American, wow. uh, you know, percussionist. Uh, the theme see. song for this show is also on that disc. Yes, thank you, voice, voice from, from Beyond. The, from beyond. Nice. That's actually Keen, the engineer who made a very good comment. The, the way this show starts off every uh, installment is with a, with a song that is on that album. Cool. I always wondered what that song was. It's, now you know where it's from. Okay, this is an interesting album. This is a reissue of No Turning Back. When I say reissue, because originally that did not have that artwork. That artwork is by the Hildebrandt brothers who are known for Star Wars. You know that famous picture where they're holding the lightsaber? Uh, and the Hildebrand brothers did some amazing artwork, and I was very impressed that the label stepped up to the plate. Really? And paid some serious bucks and got a really great artist. Wow. So, uh, yeah, that's a cool cover. That's got a 16-page booklet. And that got reissued a second time uh, by Skull Records of Poland. So there's actually three reissues on that. Jack, I'm going to have to, like, you know, listen to some of this metal stuff you got now. Because, got a yeah. lot of metal stuff, <laughs> uh, yeah. <clears throat> this was a tribute to you know, our favorite singer, Ronnie James Dio, who, f for some of the people that don't know, he was the singer of Black Sabbath, and he had his own band called Dio. And uh, the label that I was signed to, Magic Circle, did a tribute where all the various bands and artists on Magic Circle covered one of his songs. So the song that we covered was really one of my favorites. It was a song called Catch the Rainbow. Yep. And um, we did a really good job. And I just really, I don't always say that about, about everything that I've done. But I, this, our version is really good. And it's on YouTube. Really? And uh, it's, uh, if you type in Jack Star, Catch the Rainbow, uh, it's there. Cool. I like that song, so I'll have to give it a it, listen. Great song. And that was, I finally got the courage up to do a blues album in 2008. And that was it, Take It to the Bank. And uh, it's really a pretty darn good blues album. And I did that with uh, some guys, local guys that I was playing with. And uh, there's like 14 or 15 songs on it. It's a, it's a pretty lengthy album. The album clocks in at 70 minutes. Wow. Any longer than that, and it really wouldn't even fit on a CD. 
And the reason for that is it was all this material that I had been saving up for like 20 years. You know, like secretly like writing a <laughs> blues album. You know, in between like metal concerts and recording metal albums, I was like at home, you know, toying around with blues riffs, you know. And uh, I was happy that everybody in my metal band was understanding because, you know, metal people usually are not the most blues-loving people. <laughs> I mean, I'm still trying to get my, my bass player in my metal band, Ned, to, uh, to like blues. He, and he says he does, but I don't know. When I, when I do a little blues at the rehearsal, he gets a little bit, like, irked. <laughs> Though the other night, we were jamming at a club in Palm Bay. Um, anybody know the name of the club out there? Kenny, Kenny, Kenny D's. D's. Okay. We had a gig at Kenny D's, and Ned showed up. And so we started playing, and he started singing the words to a ZZ Top song. Wow. She don't love me, she just loves my automobile. And I was like, whoa, Ned, you have surprised me. <laughs> so maybe he's turning into a closet blues listener. <laughs> maybe he's always been a closet blues maybe listener. Maybe he's always been, you know. And we got another one. How one many, more. This is the how last many one. damn albums did this Jack Star guy make? Man, okay. 2003, I hadn't done a metal album in like 10 years. Most people thought I had, was totally out of it and I had become a recluse living in anonymity somewhere in the Palm witness Bay. protection <laughs> or, in, or yeah, in Palm Bay. And um, we got a call from a label in Greece. And, you know, and, and they, you know, they spoke good English, which is helpful. And they said, are you, are you still playing metal? You know, because we really like the old metal albums that you've done. And I go, yeah, I guess I'm still playing metal, you know, mainly in my kitchen, <laughs> garage, or wherever. And they go, you know, if you did a blue, uh, metal album, not a blues album, if you did a metal album, we would distribute it, we'd sign you, we'd give you a budget. And so wow. I was thinking about it, and I was like, you know, well, maybe I could do another one of these things. So it's kind of like, you know, the gunfighter coming out of retirement, and uh and I did uh, an album called Under a Savage Sky, and uh, the reaction was just overwhelmingly positive. We got like in like 300 different magazines and webzines, wow. and um, it was all positive. It was all like, where was this guy? And then, and then I had to answer that for about a year in interviews. What did you do for the <laughs> last 10 years? And truth be told is I was playing in uh, cover bands Yeah. for for like 10 years on Long Island and enjoying the hell out of it. You know, playing shows, doing classic rock, doing blues. And I was uh, thinking that maybe one day I would get back into metal and I just kind of needed the, the right opportunity. And, uh, and that's the story. Cool. That's how all this pile oh, yeah. came to. <laughs> It's a lot. Oh, and wait, we got to show one more Oops. thing. Yeah, yeah, let's show that. This album? This is really what I'm really super proud of. Um, I really love vinyl, uh, and I think that it's an honor when, it, when an album that you do, when a vinyl label wants to step up to the plate and make a vinyl release for something that you've done. And I mean, this is like a pullout. It's got, you got to show this thing. Yeah. They went whole oh, hard. Yeah. They just totally put the package on nice this yeah very nice so i'm just really thankful that this label i can't even remember the name of the label it's probably written on the back probably yeah let me just see hold on okay can you read small <laughs> metal soldiers label okay that's the name of this label and here's what i really like when you do oh, this yeah. it's it's a full that so it's really it's all good, you know, and there's about three more albums that are coming out, um, three more reissues, and uh, I'm just happy that there are people out there, whether they're in uh, Poland, Germany, Greece, Italy, Belgium, France, uh, and now lately South America, and I want to say hi to our friends in Brazil. Got a lot of mail from Brazil and Argentina lately, and uh, it's just an amazing market, you know. Yeah, metal seems bigger. Nowadays, overseas, it seems like to me. It really is. Uh, people are into it. And it's kind of like they're where America was at maybe like 15 years right. ago. You know, they're discovering metal. 
So, you know, maybe they'll discover the hula hoop or they'll discover <laughs> lava lamps <laughs> eventually, you know? Uh, well, it's, uh, it's been great being on your uh, show today, Jack, and I had a good time, and I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed having you on, and uh, I hope we can do it again sometime and uh, just keep the, the, the blues brewing. <laughs> Wait, I was almost clever there. And just keep, uh, keep doing it. And we'll see you guys next week. All right. Good show.